It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Minister of Health. Bowmanville, Kingston, Ottawa, Toronto, Alexandria, Brampton, Clinton, London, Listowel, Wingham, Perth, Kitchener, Waterloo, Chelsea, Red Lake, Kenora. Speaker, does the Minister of Health not believe closed ERs and critical bed warnings in these communities constitute a crisis? The Premier to reply. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker. First of all, I want to welcome everyone back. It's going to be an exciting session over the next little while. Also, uh, again, I want to acknowledge the former Premier. What a great Premier uh, Premier Harris was as well. Mr. Speaker, I'll, I'll tell you what, what we're doing to, to fix the, the situation we're, we're facing in health care. We're fast-tracking more health care workers by directing the College of Physicians and Surgeons, along with the College of Nurses, to quickly approve the credentials of internationally trained health care workers. This builds on the 760 internationally trained nurses already deployed, Mr. Speaker. In four years, in four years, as the Liberals were firing nurses, uh, to be exact, 1,600 nurses, we're actually hiring, and we've hired, 14,579 net new nurses. Mr. Speaker. Response. Mr. Speaker, on top of that, we've hired over 10,500 health care workers through the COVID emergency staffing programs. We've also... Thank you. The supplementary question. Again to the Premier, families in each of these communities saw their ERs and urgent care centres closed because they didn't have enough nurses, PSWs or health care workers to treat patients. It's clear to me and most Ontarians that we are in a crisis, but just a few days ago the Minister of Health said it's not a crisis. How bad does it have to be before the Minister and the Premier take action on the solutions that nurses and health care workers are proposing, take action to make sure that we can deal with the crisis in our health care system. To reply, the Premier. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, as I said, we've hired 14,579 new nurses, and I agree. I agree. Do we need more nurses? 100 per cent. And what we're doing to get more nurses, Mr. Mr. Uh, Speaker, we're putting hundreds of millions of dollars into a program to make sure that we attract new nurses. And I'll give you one example. We introduced the Learn and Stay grant for, uh, for uh, graduating nurses. So we will be taking care of their tuition and any cost if they serve in an underserved area. We're going to focus on that. Mr. Speaker, we're also, as I mentioned, we're investing another $342 million to add 5,000 more nurses to the system. If there was 5,000 nurses that could fly from the sky, we'd be hiring them tomorrow. We're coming up with solutions, Mr. Speaker. We launched the largest med medical school expansion in over Response. 10 years, 160 undergraduates, along with 295 postgraduates. This is what we're doing to make sure that we take care of the health care system, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The final supplementary. Speaker, again to the Premier. Health care workers have been very clear about the solutions that we need, including repealing Bill 124 and improving working conditions. Right? Bold action starts with support for Ontario's health care heroes. Will this government make changes to improve working conditions for nurses and health care workers by implementing 10 permanent paid sick days and putting in place a robust Workplace Violence Prevention Program. Yeah. In response, the Premier. I mentioned, uh, Mr. Speaker, under under the NDP and the Liberal Watch, they they actually fired 1,600 nurses. What we've done, and it's it's a, it's a big thank you because the nurses are absolutely phenomenal. We gave them a well-deserved $5,000 retention bonus. I call it the thank you bonus. That's an increase of 7.6 percent on the average 
Right across the country, that is the highest increase any province has ever seen. We're above the national average. We're always going to make sure we're there for our nurses. They do a spectacular job. We'll always have their backs. But I understand, Mr. Speaker, Order. they need to have more support, and that's what we're going to give them. We're going to give them another 5,000 more colleagues. We're going to pour money into the health care system as we have. We've added billions and billions of dollars compared to the health care system four years ago that the NDP and the Liberals absolutely Response. destroyed. The next question, the member for Davenport. Mr. Speaker, and this, this question is for the Premier. Speaker, in July, I shared an internal memo from Toronto Western Hospital frantically trying to keep their emergency department open. They narrowly avoided that closure that time, but they were just one of 25 hospitals across this province facing emergency room closures on a single weekend. Speaker, from our smallest community health centres to our busiest urban hospitals, our system is being pushed to the breaking point while this government's budget remains status quo speaker to the premier how many more er's and urgent care centers have to close before he finally admits this is a crisis the deputy premier and minister of health to reply thank you speaker it's an honor to be able to rise today and talk about this very important issue you know in our throne speech yesterday we mentioned that we will build a health system that better cares for patients and keeps our province open. And we are doing that with all of the partners, which is why, frankly, I have met with the Ontario Nurses Union. I've met with the College of, of Nurses to say we need to expedite internationally trained nurses who are in the province of Ontario here today and waiting for those licenses. We will continue to do that. We will work with all partners to make sure, including hospital CEOs, that when they need the support, to get those health care workers in emergency departments, they'll be there and their government has their back. Thank you. Well Speaker, the, the nurses seated right here today beg to differ. Even when the emergency units stay open, wait times are growing. Two-year-old Harish and his family were left waiting 11 hours in an ER waiting room with a high fever before leaving without ever seeing a doctor. The family finally got hope from their, help for their son from a walk-in clinic two days later. Thank goodness he is safe and healthy now. Speaker, can the minister explain what she considers acceptable for a child to get emergency care? Is it 19 hours? Is it 11 hours? How is that even remotely acceptable? Minister of Health. Speaker, there is no doubt that when we hear these types of stories of individuals who have had to wait with their loved ones in emergency rooms for services, it disturbs all of us. But that is why, frankly, our government proactively, when we came into government in 2018, ensured that there are 3,500 additional hospital beds that are operating in the province of Ontario today that Order. were not here in 2018. There are 10,500 health care workers who are operating, who are, who are working in the province of Ontario, in community, in long-term care, in our hospitals that wouldn't have been there, frankly, under the previous Liberal government. We'll continue to make these investments. We'll continue to talk to the partners to get all of those excellent ideas of how we can make Response. sure that the hospital system, the home care system, the long-term care system is there when people need it. Good Thank job. you. The final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, beds don't look after patients. People do. Health care workers do. Yeah. Ontarians looking for excuses. They just want to know that basic medical care is going to be there when they need it. I had an ER nurse from my community tell me just yesterday that the ICU they work in is at full capacity with only half the staff to care for a full roster of patients. How can the Premier look our exhausted and demoralized nurses in the eye? Those health care workers who are desperately ringing the alarms on staffing shortages and tell them that Bill 124 is here to stay. Minister of Health. Speaker, the member opposite can talk about problems. I will give solutions. Yeah. We have added an additional 10,500 health care workers in the province of Ontario that were not there and, frankly, would not have been there under the previous Liberal government. We have already invested in ensuring that we have a nurses offload program to make sure that when paramedics bring those emergency patients into emergency, there are dedicated nurses who are funded, 
and prepared to take that patient on so that that paramedic can get back out into community and do the critical work that they need. Those are the types of solutions that are coming to us from our partners that we're working with Ontario Health, uh, hospital CEOs, nurses unions to make sure that the solutions we bring forward actually impact patient care in a positive way. Here, here. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Ottawa West Computer. Thank you, Speaker. It's our health care workers who are putting forward solutions, and it's the government that's refusing to implement any of the solutions that they're asking for. Right on. This past weekend, Montfort and Carleton Place hospitals needed to close their emergency departments due to lack of staff. The Queensway Carleton Hospital, which has only been able to keep their ER open because of some creative staffing arrangements, has patients waiting up to 12 hours to be seen. Speaker, these wait times and closures are unacceptable in Ottawa and across the province. What is the government's plan to ensure that Ottawa area hospitals have the resources they need to keep ERs open and to provide patients with care in a reasonable amount of time? To reply, the Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, we, we talk about preparing for, and we've done that. Ottawa is about to see the largest hospital expansion in the history of Ontario. We have made that commitment. We are working towards those solutions because we've worked with the organizations, the OMA. We want to make sure that when people want to see their family doc, the family doc is available to see them. So we have expanded a program that allows them and funds them to see patients in the evening, on the weekends. Those Order. are the types of quantitative real solutions that are going to make a difference. Then we are seeing people get the health care they need where they want it, when they need it. There is no doubt that when a hospital has to shut an emergency for four hours Response. for a shift, it is very challenging for the community. But we work with partners to make sure it is as seamless as possible and patients' lives are protected. The supplementary question. I would invite the minister to have that conversation with my constituents who are waiting 12 hours for care. With health care in Ottawa already teetering on the brink, the Pinecrest Queensway Community Health Centre in my riding of Ottawa West Nepean is laying off health care workers with years of experience and good performance reviews. Speaker, this is a tumultuous situation in which one third of staff have been laid off or have left over the past three years. Community health centres serve some of our most vulnerable members. Now these patients are contacting my office to say they have nowhere to turn. Will the Minister of Health launch an immediate investigation into the Pinecrest Queensway Community Health Centre to ensure that funding and staffing decisions are being made in the best interests of patients? Again, Minister of Health, reply. Mr. Speaker, you know, I'm going to reinforce uh, what we raised in the throne speech yesterday, and that was that our government intends to build a health system that better cares for patients and keeps our province open. We should be proud of how we have protected our citizens through a very challenging pandemic. And there is no doubt that one of the hardest hit areas was our frontline nurses, our frontline first responders. We get that. We've invested. We've made those changes. Specifically related to your question, I think that uh, you have already written me on that. We will look into it to make sure that due diligence has happened in that particular situation. But I want to reassure the people of Ontario and this people in the House that we are making those investments in Ottawa, in Windsor, in Niagara, in Brampton to make sure we have a health care system that is robust and prepared to protect the people of Ontario. Thank you. The next question, the member for Mississauga Streetsville. Speaker, congratulations on your re-election as Speaker. Speaker, for 42 years, under a progressive Conservative government, Ontario became a manufacturing powerhouse able to compete with any jurisdiction. Yet, under the previous Liberal government, jobs began to leave when high taxes, red tape and out-of-control electricity prices made Ontario one of the least competitive jurisdictions in North America. The result? 300,000 people lost their jobs when Liberal policies forced manufacturers right out of Ontario. 
Now, Mr. Speaker, my question is a simple one. Can the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade assure my constituents, workers, their families and the communities that rely on manufacturing jobs that they will not be abandoned? And specifically, will he highlight the measures he is taking to protect and question. grow the sector in Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, our government can assure Ontario families of our strong support for advanced manufacturers. And we also understand the need to invest uh, in talent and equipment that they need to be our global leaders, specifically our Advanced Manufacturing and Innovation Competitiveness Fund, or AMIC, does exactly that. AMIC is our uh, two-year, $40 million program that supports Ontario's advanced manufacturing sector. Ontario companies are investing millions in equipment, advanced technologies, and the skilled workforces they need to be competitive. Every week, you will hear about AMIC and our other investments in automotive, aerospace, life sciences, IT, chemicals, steel. These sectors each Response. employ tens of thousands of workers and are the cornerstones of our, of our economy, and each one is proof that Ontario is open for business. <laughs> the supplementary question. Thank you, Minister, for that reassurance. Speaker, this past June, Statistics Canada provided an advanced estimate of manufacturing sector sales reports. These reports indicate that manufacturing sales actually fell 1% in June, with the largest decreases in the aerospace product and parts industry. The throne speech highlighted the need to grow the economy. It talked about risks to the economy. For my constituents, that means lost jobs. It means missed mortgage payments. What is the minister doing to protect families who rely on good jobs, local jobs, with manufacturers who are so important to communities right across Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Economic Development. Speaker, that's an important question because it highlights exactly why we stepped up with our $40 million AMIC fund. We needed this program because jobs left Ontario under the policies of the previous government. Here's an example of success from the member's own riding. Cyclone Manufacturing is a leading global supplier of aerospace components. They just announced a $21.4 million expansion at their plants in Ontario to invest in new technologies, including advanced robotics. On Monday, we were at Cyclone to detail our government's $1.5 million AMIC investment. Now, this investment will bring back, it will reshore 60 jobs back to Ontario to do things that have been done outside of the country, and it will provide upskilling for another 100 employees at Cyclone's four plants in Mississauga and Bons. Milton. The Liberals drove jobs away, and that this is another example of our government bringing jobs back. Next question, the member for Niagara Falls. My question is to the Premier. Today in this House, we are joined by members of the United Steelworkers. Those members are grieving because in June of this year, they lost a brother to a workplace death at National Steel Car. His death was the third death in two years at the same workplace. A worker is dying at National Steel Car every seven months. That's three workers whose families will never see them again, whose children will never see them again, and whose communities are devastated and grieving their loss. Mr. Speaker, it could not be more clear that this is an unsafe workplace. Workers do not go to work to die, not at National Steel Car or anywhere. When will the Premier and the Minister take this seriously, meet with the United Steelworkers, and make National Steel Car a safe place to work? Thank you. Reply on behalf of the government, the government house leader. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, let me just uh, thank the honourable member for the question because it is uh, obviously a very important one, and to the workers who are. Uh, uh, here with us uh, today. Uh, I know it, it probably doesn't matter to them or their family, but I, I know that uh, all of us on both sides of the House, uh, uh, our sympathies uh, go out uh, to the worker. I know we are very unified, all of us, in that. I know at the same time, uh, all of us, uh, uh, regardless of what side of the House uh, we're on, know how important it is to keep our workplaces uh, uh, safe. 
uh, and that has been a priority of, uh, of, of this Minister uh, of, of Labour. But, Mr. Speaker, let me just say that uh, uh, it has not really mattered who has been serving in government. I would think that all parties, all the time, have uh, put worker safety first. I know in this particular uh, instance, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, an investigation has, uh, has, was underway. Uh, there are 70. There have been 75 visits. There are 78 orders uh, uh, with respect to National uh, Steel Car. I know that the ministry uh, has uh, uh, set up meetings with both uh, uh, the with the representatives of the company as well as uh, uh, the union, and there are actions in front of the court with respect to occupational health and safety. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. I have letters here that since June that haven't been answered by the minister. Every worker in our province deserves to survive their shift and return home health and safe. The United Steel Workers, who represent these workers, have demanded a meeting with the Minister of Labour to hold National Steel Car to account, protect their members, and assure people are safe at work. You know what the Minister has done with that request? He ignored it. Just this week, two more workers have been killed at work in Ajax. Under the Westway law, Government is supposed to provide training to law enforcement officers to make them aware of their responsibility to investigate workplace fatalities. Speaker, will the Premier direct his Solicitor General to do this today, ask his Minister of Labour to stop hiding from the United Steelworkers, and above all, Question. will he take any action at all to make workplaces in Ontario safe so workers can go to work? to perform a fair day's work for a fair day's pay and go home to their families. To respond, the government house leader. Mr. Speaker, I, I certainly appreciate uh, the passion that the member brings to it. I can't think of any situation that would be more horrific than for a family to uh, uh, receive a visit uh, when a loved one is at work and to be told that their loved one will not be coming home uh, uh, somebody who has worked uh, day in and day out, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, I can't think of something even more horrific than that. Uh, uh, and again, I say to those uh, those uh, in attendance, uh, all of us, all of us, uh, our sympathies directly to the, the families, not only of this in this instance, but of all workers who have. Uh, who have uh, died in the line of duty. But at the same time, Mr. Speaker, a lot of work has been done here. And I know the member wants more, and there will be more, because that's what the Minister of Labour has been doing since the day he took the job. As I highlighted uh, earlier, there have been 75 visits to this facility. There are 73 orders uh, requiring uh, for a national steel car. And there is action in front of the courts with respect Response. to uh, 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 health and safety uh, contraventions by national steel car, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Next question. Ajax. Thank you. Speaker, earlier the Minister of Economic Development toted Ontario's progress in attracting advanced manufacturing to Ontario. However, Russia's unprovoked and illegal attack of Ukraine, along with growing instability in Asia, as China attempts to destabilize the region, has left our global partners seeking a strong, stable, reliable source of critical materials. The Ring of Fire in North Ontario is that source. Now more than ever, the world is looking at Ontario and the Ring of Fire with deposits of essential critical materials, valued at an estimated $60 billion. My question to the Minister of Mines, at what stage is the, of the development, and what is the next major milestone for success? To reply, the Minister. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much for the question, and through you to the uh, member from Ajax. Thank you for the questions. Because of our government's commitment, we are getting it done for the people of Northern Ontario. Here, here. In April, chiefs of Martin Falls Nation, First Nation and Webeke First Nation announced that they have completed the terms of reference for the proposed Northern Road Link Environmental Assessment. The Northern Rink Road Link project is an Indigenous-led environmental assessment which integrates Indigenous principles with the provincial process. 
The Northern Road Lake will connect two proposed roads, the 200-kilometer Martin Falls to our Arrow Road Community Access Road at the south end and the proposed 110-kilometer Webbecay Supply Road to the Ring of the Fire and the Ring of Fire at the northern end. Our government remains committed to the success of this project with nearly a billion dollars in funding to support critical legacy of infrastructure such as the planning and construction of an all-season road network and an investment in high-speed internet roads upgrades and other community projects. The supplementary question. Speaker, respecting and working with our First Nation partners is a key to achieving success for this development project. The minister himself publicly stated the following, nothing will be accomplished without the support and participation of First Nations. Speaker, the First Nations communities themselves deserve to be part of the success of this project. First Nations want to see their communities prosper. They want to see economic benefits that should occur to any community in Ontario or Canada. They want to provide a better future for their younger generations. Speaker, the minister recently met with First Nation communities of Web Webequay and Martin Falls. Can the minister please provide the House an update on the nature of these meetings as it relates to the Ring of Fire development? Again, the minister Myers. Thank you, Speaker, and through you to the, minister, to the member from Ajax. Back in July, I was honoured to accept Chief Wabasee's invitation to the Webake First Nations Summer Festival and meet with chiefs, chiefs and council from Webake and Martin Falls First Nations. I acknowledge both chiefs for their leadership and resolve that allowed them to make progress on their respective community projects and, make, and the Northern Road Link environmental assessments despite the pandemic. We discussed how important our ongoing partnership is to ensure these projects get built the right way. We talked about how important all season roads will be to their, to their communities to have better access for housing, health care, social services and education. We talked about how developing the critical minerals deposits in the Ring of Fire would advance economic reconciliation, creating prospect, prosperity for their communities and high quality local employment for their people. Response. Mr. Speaker, it was a privilege to visit Webeke First Nation, and I look forward to continuing our important work with both communities. Thank you. Next question, the member for Waterloo. Well, thank you very much. My question is to the Minister of Health. After spending weeks in hiding, avoiding accountability, the government is downplaying what Ontario Health is calling an unprecedented hospital staffing shortage. Grand River Hospital in Waterloo Region was recently forced to close an operating room and postpone elective surgeries because 120 staff members were off with COVID-19. According to Health Quality Ontario, as of April, half of the hospitals whose average ER wait time topped the provincial average were in Waterloo Region. That average is over 19 hours waiting in an emergency room. When will this government stop normalizing this grave position our health care system is in and start listening to health care professionals' calls to action? Everything is not okay. The Minister of Health. So again, Speaker, I will reinforce, it is deeply disturbing when we have an emergency department that must close, whether that's for four hours, a shift, or in fact a weekend. We work very closely with Ontario Health, with hospital CEOs and management to make sure that they have explored every option to ensure that that does not happen. When it does, we have safeguards in place that include making sure that first responders, paramedics understand where the redirect is, often, frankly, within 15 minutes of the nearest hospital. We want to make sure that we build the capacity, and we will continue to do that. As the member opposite knows, I've spoken to and I have directed the, the Nursing College of Ontario, the College of Physicians and Surgeons, to act quickly to make sure that Every response. possible individual in the province of Ontario that wants to work in health care has that opportunity. Thank you. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, an emergency room should never close. That is unacceptable for the province of Ontario. In the last, in the last
last year, in the last year, we have lost 5,400 health care workers because of wage suppression policies from this government. If this government was actually concerned about, t about the urgency of what is happening in our health care system, they would listen to ONA, they would listen to RNAO and other groups of health care professionals, and you would repeal Bill 124. <laughs> Instead, the Minister of Health says repealing Bill 124 is a conversation for another day. That is a direct quote. Well, we think that day is right now. That day is today. Why is this government actively, actively preventing nurses uh, and other health care workers Question. from being fairly compensated in our system? To reply, the President of the Treasury Board. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. We are incredibly grateful to our frontline health care heroes for the contributions they are making across this province, Mr. Speaker. That is why we have made record and historic investments to support health care and health care health human resources across this province. Order. We have added 10,500 additional health care professionals to the system since uh, March of 2020. Mr. Speaker, the members opposite have voted against each and every single one of those measures. This also includes building capacity for the future, which involves creating the first new medical school in the GTA in over 100 years in the city of Brampton. Another measure, Mr. Speaker, Another measure, Mr. Speaker, that the opposition voted against. On this side of the House, this government will, will continue Response. to work to support health care across this province. The next question, member for Don Valley East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. This summer, we have seen unprecedented levels of pressure placed on our hospitals, like nothing I've seen in my career. Emergency departments, intensive care units, and other critical services are closed due to severe staffing shortages. Nothing on this scale has ever been seen before in our province. Imagine, Mr. Speaker, that you or someone you loved had a heart attack or a stroke. Imagine that you are a mother and your newborn child suddenly seizes before you. And if that isn't bad enough, imagine now that all of this happens in a community that just lost its emergency department. This is the reality for too many Ontarians this summer. And yet we've all heard the minister's comments. And so, Speaker, through you, I ask, can the Question. Minister of Health please finally provide her assessment and explain why she doesn't think that the current situation in our hospitals is a crisis? Minister of Health. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite. Welcome to your new role as a parliamentarian. You know, imagine, Speaker, imagine if we hadn't had a government four years ago who had invested in, in making sure that we had 3,500 new hospital beds operating in the province of Ontario. Imagine, Speaker, if we hadn't taken the time to ensure and expand so that we had 10,500 new health care resource people working in community, in hospital, in long-term care. I worry about that. Imagine if we hadn't had a premier who had the foresight to say we are going to make sure we have the capacity in the province of Ontario to make sure that any pandemic, any future issues, we have capacity within our health care system. We have that and we will continue to work forward with that. Thank you. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, we are in a growing province with a growing population. Each successive administration brings in more health care workers, more beds, more hospitals. The question is, is it enough? The reality, the reality Order. is that the first thing that this government did when they came into power in 2018 was to go to the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario and cancel programs that would have brought more foreign trained health care workers into this province. The question here is, have they done enough? And I believe, Minister, the, the answer is categorically no. Please correct me. Minister of Health. With the greatest of respect, Speaker, this member opposite needs to understand the liberal history in health care in the province of Ontario. The Liberals fired nurses, we hired teachers, we hired nurses. The Liberals closed hospitals, 
We are opening hospitals. We are building capacity. We will continue to do that. We are working with the colleges of nurses. We are working with the physicians and surgeons of Ontario to make sure that everyone who wants to practice in the healthcare system in the province of Ontario has the opportunity to do that quickly. Thank you, Speaker. Next question, the member for Essex. Speaker. For too long, the people and businesses in parts of southwestern Ontario have been living without access to reliable, high-speed internet. The agricultural sector relies on reliable internet to operate and to make connections, to make business decisions, market their products, operate on-farm technology, and maximize farming techniques, among many other things. Ontario's agricultural business sector is a leader in modern and innovative technological practices and, co no, and can no longer rely on old and outdated techniques. The government recently made an announcement highlighting investments in high-speed internet infrastructure. Can the Minister of Infrastructure please explain how this will benefit the people of my riding in Essex? Will my farmers be able to access reliable, high-speed internet, and will a promise be a reality? To respond, the Minister of Infrastructure. I want to thank the member from Essex for the question. Our government knows how important access to reliable, high-speed internet services are for families, businesses, and farmers, which is why we're investing nearly $4 billion to make high-speed internet services accessible in every corner of the province by the end of 2025. Last week, we announced a huge accomplishment in our broadband strategy that's connecting as many as 266,000 unserved and underserved homes across 339 municipalities. As part of the reverse auction announcement, we're making internet accessible to as many as 3,970 homes and businesses in Lakeshore, Essex, Kingsville, LaSalle, and Amherstburg. This is just one of the many ways our government is addressing the needs of our communities and supporting the good people in southwestern Ontario. And the supplementary question. Speaker, I want to highlight the recent broadband disruption. The outage impacted many Ontarians. It impacted businesses who typically use debit transactions and point-of-sale machines, forcing businesses to turn to cash until service was restored. The head of the Canadian Federation of Independent Business said small businesses may have lost thousands of dollars because of the service disruption. Unfortunately for many of my constituents, that is a way of life. Repeated service interruptions or areas with little connectivity is something that we have been forced to live with because of the failures of the previous Liberal government. Speaker, through you, how are we supporting the connectivity needs in areas such as my riding, the riding Question. of Essex, that may not have been covered through reverse auction? They deserve coverage, and unlike the previous member of Essex, Thank you. Thank you very much. Minister of Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, we are committed to ensuring every community province-wide has access to high-speed internet. The results of the reverse auction were extremely positive. 266,000 more premises will be connected. But there is more work to do. While the reverse auction was underway, our ministry, with the help of Infrastructure Ontario, focused on our last mile strategy to connect the remaining 40 to 60,000 homes. We are also engaging with internet service providers to understand which technologies and business models work best to reach these remaining homes and businesses. All options are being considered. Mr. Speaker, we are, we are almost at our goal. We will make sure everyone is connected by the end of 2025. Next question, the member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Uh, my question is to the Minister of Health. SickKids is one of the best hospitals for children in the world, but the hospital's ability to help see and heal children is being put to test by this government. Demand at SickKids is skyrocketing. Visits to the emergency room are up 47 per cent, 
and over 3,400 children are waiting for surgery beyond the acceptable timeline for them to wait. No child, no child should have to wait too long for necessary surgery, Minister. This is my question. What is this government's plan to address the surgery backlog at SickKids? Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Speaker. You know, there's no doubt that Sick Kids holds a very special place in all of our hearts. We know that it leads um, Canada, and frankly, I, I think right now it is fourth in the world for the innovative, amazing work that Sick Kids does. So I really appreciate the fact that the, the member opposite has raised this. You know, our government appreciates this and understands it, acknowledges it, uh, which is why, frankly, we gave. Uh, sick kids a 4.3 percent increase to their base operating, which uh, equates to $22 million. We're going to work with sick kids. We want to make sure that that world-class reputation that we are all so proud of as Ontarians and Canadians continues to be able to offer their expertise to the world. Thank you. Any supplementary question? Thank you. My question is back to the Minister of Health. The leadership at Sick Kids see it differently. SickKids is facing a huge funding shortfall. They've had $120 million removed from their budget over the past decade, and this hospital is short $45 million this year. Open staffing positions are not being filled, and staffing in the critical care units is down by 15%. Minister, this is my question. Can you increase funding to SickKids to meet the need to address the staffing shortages so that children can get the care that they need? Minister of Health. So again, Speaker, I will remind the member opposite, in fact, we have already increased funding to sick kids in the amount of 4.3 per cent, which equates to $22 million. We're working with sick kids actively to make sure that anything that we can do to assist, to find those uh, opportunities that sick kids provides, incredible um, in, in, incredible opportunities across the world and in Canada, we'll work with sick kids. We will continue to work with sick kids to make sure that that opportunity is there for us when we need it. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The auto industry has been a long, long a vital source of jobs, innovation and prosperity in this province. In communities across Ontario, thousands work in auto manufacturing facilities directly or in businesses, small and large, that supply that sector. Under the reckless policies of the previous Liberal government, a carbon tax, red tape, high taxes and out-of-control electricity prices cost Ontarians jobs and left facilities shuttered. Uncertainty has long been the enemy of investment and we are in a period of global uncertainty. Mr. Speaker, can the minister provide any comfort to the thousands, of uh, thousands employed in the industry and in the communities that rely on that the government will not abandon this sector as the Liberals did when they declared manufacturing in Question. Ontario to be dead? The minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Ford, $1.8 billion, GM, $2.3 billion, Stellantis, $3.6 billion, Honda, $1.4 billion, LGE, $5.2 billion. Speaker, what should bring comfort is the fact that over the last 20 months, Ontario has attracted a record $16 billion in auto investments. These are game-changing, historic investments, ushering in a new era for Ontario's auto industry, providing employment for thousands more workers. And most recently, uh, Belgium's Umicor announced a $1.5 billion investment to build North America's first industrial-scale battery materials plant, and they're doing it here in Ontario. The facility will locate in Loyalist Township and provide employment for a thousand people just for the construction phase, Speaker. And Umicor is here because they saw Ontario reduce the cost of doing business by $7 billion. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Ontario should be a leader when it comes to the auto industry. It should be a leader when it comes to the emerging technology markets, and we should be a leader when it comes to jobs and innovation. Liberal government policies like taxes, carbon tax, red tape, and high electricity led to the closure of plants and the loss of 300,000 jobs, putting communities at risk. The auto sector th in Ontario thrives when it's integrated, when we produce and supply the products and services for all parts for, the, uh, for a vehicle. While the Umicore invest investment is historic in many ways, a great privilege to be in my own uh, backyard, history has shown that unless it's integrated into the larger production process, its impact will be limited. I asked the minister, Question. can you explain the economic spin-offs of this investment? Of economic development. The Umocore plant will be North America's first ever industrial scale facility to produce these battery materials. These cathodes account for 50% of the value of an electric vehicle battery. They contain Northern Ontario's critical minerals like nickel, cobalt, and lithium. And when at full production, this plant will produce enough cathode material to produce batteries for 1 million EVs every single year. That's almost 20% of all of North America's EV production. And so these materials that we're now seeing built in Ontario were the missing piece of the puzzle. This is all to create our end-to-end -end supply chain. But now we have all of the core pieces, from minerals all the way through to manufacturing. $16 billion in months. auto investments in 20 months. Speaker, this government is getting it done. Here, here, here. The next question, the member for Hamilton West, and Castor Dundas. Speaker, my question to the Premier. The Minister of Health said it would be completely inappropriate to say our health care system is in crisis. But right now, in Hamilton, health care officials describe the situation as increasingly precarious. Both Hamilton General and the Jurvinsky are running over 120 per cent patient capacity, forced to pay double just to keep emergency rooms open, and code zero events, where no ambulances are available to respond, continue to rise. Speaker, I ask, how bad is too bad before this government will acknowledge this crisis? Mr. Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, I, I am reminded of a visit I made to St. Joe's a couple of weeks ago, and uh, it was to be updated on a recent investment that our government has made to ensure that their emergency department is protecting our most vulnerable individuals who have serious mental health illnesses who need to have that specialized emergency care. And um, frankly, they are very excited about the opportunity to finally get that expansion. That coupled with 52 different hospital expansions that are in process in the province of Ontario. That is unprecedented. When we see the kinds of investments that we are making in our hospital, in our health care system, it makes me very proud to serve with this Premier, with this caucus, because it means we understand and appreciate you need to Response. make investments, you need to build to make sure that we have the health care system we need when people need it. Thank you. Supplementary question. Speaker. Everyone knows, maybe perhaps with the exception of this minister, that the first step to solving a problem is to acknowledge there is one. The Chief of Emergency Medicine at St. Joe's described what's happening as a perfect storm, leading to a situation we haven't seen in the past. Um, a breaking point, a disaster, unprecedented. These are words that health minister, health not health ministers, health officials are using to describe the situation right now. So my question to the minister, to the premier, with Ontario nurses here in the House, why do you continue to deny the reality of the crisis in our health care system? Mr. Speaker, I've said it at the beginning and I will say it at the end. We will work with all partners who have solutions. So far, I haven't heard any solutions from the other side. I have heard solutions from hospital Order. CEOs, from nurses' unions, from the College of Nurses, from the College of Physicians and Surgeons. I have solutions that they are bringing forward saying, if we do this, if you allow us to do this, we can make a change. Our government has already started 
those investments. We have the hospital infrastructure that we want. We have already invested to ensure that we have personal support workers in community, in our long-term care, and we will continue that work because we understand how critically important it is. Thank you, Speaker. The next question, the member for Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry, and I'd like to congratulate him on his uh, election uh, here in the legislature. Mr. Speaker, uh, summer in Ontario means that it is also forest fire season. Last year, Ontario faced unprecedented levels of forest fires in terms of the number of fires and in hectares burned. This year's fire season has been more manageable, due in part to greater snow melt and rainfall in the spring. However, conditions can change quickly, and we need to be able to respond quickly. Forest fires can be devastating for communities, people, and the industry. What steps is our government taking to prevent communities across Ontario from the devastating effects that forest fires can bring? Thank you. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. I want to thank the member from Carleton for the question and congratulate her on her re-election as well. And Mr. Speaker, tell you that this year we've been able to avoid implementing restricted fire zones, which are an important tool to help prevent forest fires. But as my colleague reminds us, the situation could change at any time. And although there are fewer fires burning this year, there are still thousands of hectares at risk across Ontario. We remain at a high level of alert with ministry fire rangers and our fleet of water bombers and helicopters at the ready. And the supplementary question. Thank you for, to the minister for the response. Mr. Speaker, as you know, many communities across Ontario rely on the summer season for travel and tourism-related jobs and economic growth. Whether it is camping, cottaging, or the hundreds of summer jobs for students who work in reforestation, forest fires put, it all, of, put all of this at risk. Often, forest fires are started by human activity. We have all seen media coverage of mismanaged fireworks, simply not making sure a campfire is put out, and who can forget that disastrous gender reveal party in California that started the destructive El Dorado fire, destroying five homes and sadly killing a firefighter. While it might seem like common sense, can the minister provide some advice to Ontarians who are spending time outdoors this season, and what are the risks to those Question. who are irresponsible with fire? Thank you. Mr. Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you, Speaker. We, you know, we all have a part to play when it comes to preventing forest fires, and one thing that's important is good forest management, making sure we have robust forest management plans that don't leave forests with a lot of excess wood. To the average person out there, I'd say make sure you're following municipal fire bans, never leave your campfire unattended, and make sure you put it out properly when you're done. If a person causes a fire, they can be held responsible for the cost of extinguishing that fire or property damage incurred by that fire. With that being said, let's stay diligent. Let's keep this fire season a mild one. Thank you. Next question, the member for Toronto, St. Paul. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. Our public health care system is in crisis because this government refuses to respect and protect our frontline health care workers, like Ashley and Laureen right in St. Paul's and the Ashleys and Laureens across Ontario. Our nurses are run off their feet. Their mental and physical health is crumbling. The official opposition, ONA here today, RNAO, nurses in my riding, patients have sent this government solutions and we have been ignored. My question is to the minister. Will this Conservative government repeal Bill 124 and help save our public health care system and the lives of our nurses and their patients for once and for all? Will you? President of the Treasury Board. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We look uh, forward to continuing to work with our health care professionals across this province and continue to be incredibly grateful for all the work that they have been doing. And that is why this government has made record and historic investments to support health human resources across this province. Since March of 2020, we have added over 10,500 health care professionals across this province. We are also introducing and building across this province over 52 new capital projects to support 
further health care capacity, including new hospitals in cities like Brampton that were ignored and neglected uh, by the previous Liberal government, building in cities like Windsor, Ottawa, and Mississauga. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to invest in health care and health care workers across this province. And the supplementary question. Anyways, my question is back to the Minister of Health. To overcome the labour shortage, the government has hired private agencies to recruit nurses, a much more expensive option than simply paying nurses fairly. It is this that has many questioning whether Bill 124 was ever about fiscal restraint as much as building a pathway for the private sector to take even tighter hold of our fragile care system and drive it into the ground. My question is back to the minister. Will you stop the privatization, yes, the privatization of health care by investing in Order. public sector's workers, patients and families, and repealing Bill 124? It's what we're all asking for. Forget about the official opposition. All that's Order. asking for it. Nurses question. and patients, question. yes or no. Will you repeal Bill 124? Yes. President of the Treasury Board to reply again. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to make record and historic investments in our health care system to support uh, people across this province. This includes this year investing over $342 million uh, to support uh, and add over 5,000 new and upskilled registered nurses and practical nurses, as well as an additional 8,000 personal support workers. Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House and our government, we continue to look to uh, solutions to support the health care system. The members opposite have voted against each and every single one of those members, including adding Order. an additional 10,500 health care support workers since March of 2020. We look forward to working with the members opposite and building hospitals across Response. the province, building health care capacity across this province to ensure that people get the care they need. And very much. Next question, the member for Barry Innisfil. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My uh, question is for the Minister of Legislative Affairs. Um, we have a lot of people that came to watch Question Period today, and I want to thank you for coming. But many of you may wonder why we had a delay in, uh, in Question Period today. So I want to ask the Minister of Legislative Affairs if he can kind of explain to us that delay that happened today. Thank you. <laughs> to reply, the Minister of Legislative Affairs. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I do appreciate the question from the member because it is actually a very serious one, despite the uh, the cat calling from the opposition, uh, Speaker. And I want to thank Broadcasting Services, trying to keep a building this old, <laughs> trying to keep a building this old running each and every day. Uh, is truly uh, is truly amazing, and they do extraordinary work, Mr. Speaker. Uh, just yesterday, when you, know, you saw the uh, the speech from the throne, I'm sure as members were coming here, they saw wires all over the place. Uh, that's what it takes to keep this building building this old operating, Speaker, and that is why the Premier uh, has uh, made the decision that uh, working together with members on all sides of the House, it is time for us to look at different options to renovate this building, bring it back to the stature that it was when it first opened, Mr. Speaker, to provide the people of the province of Ontario a legislative assembly that can be here for the next 150 years, Mr. Speaker, and we are going to work very closely with members on all sides of this House to make sure that we give Ontarians the best possible legislative assembly, the one Response. that they can be proud of, Mr. Speaker, and we're well on our way to making that happen. Thank you. A supplementary question. Well, uh, I, I want to thank the Minister of Legislative Affairs for that, uh, that great answer, and it really builds on what we introduced yesterday through the Minister of Finance as we introduced the build, uh, Plan to Build Ontario Act. As we're building core infrastructure like highways and, and core infrastructure like hospitals, as the Minister of Health said, it's also important to build up the foundation of our democracy. So I wanted to ask the Minister of Legislative Affairs how he's building up this democratic institution we have and some of the options we're looking at. The Minister of Legislative Affairs. Uh, really, uh, uh, another, another, uh, a really good question, Mr. Speaker, because obviously we, uh, Order. Uh, obviously Order. we are intending to be here. I don't know why the NDP are so upset about a question about democracy and about the House of the People of the Province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Order. It's almost like they're reliving the election. <laughs> it's like they're upset that they've now been put into a little corner because for a lot of time they spent talking about the van party that was the Liberals. 
but the people of Ontario have almost reduced them to a van party. In fact, it's half a bus now, Mr. Speaker. The reality is the leader of the opposition isn't sitting uh, in his traditional seat, not because the place is too small, but because the NDP caucus is small, Mr. Speaker. But we're going to fix that. We're going to fix that because this place needs to be here for the next generation of parliamentarians who sit in this place. Regardless of how they feel about it, this side feels that this place needs to reflect the importance of the province of Ontario. And again, I want to thank Broadcasting Services for the work that they do each and every day to keep a building 150 years old operating, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Stop the clock. Order. Order. We'll start the clock. Member for Niagara Centre. Well, back to health care, Speaker. That's what we care about on this side of the House. <laughs> speaker, in Niagara and across this province, question to the Minister of Health. Health care workers are making immense sacrifices, postponing vacations, taking extra shifts, and losing the time off they need to recover from the grueling work they've been doing since the pandemic began. All the while, the Premier and Minister of Health have been missing in action on summer vacation. Our Niagara hospitals are so close to the breaking point that our local mayors and regional chair had to release a joint letter to the public asking residents to avoid the ER or risk stressing the system beyond capacity. Will the minister admit that it is her absence and the absence of her government that is the problem, not workers who are being asked to work through their vacation? Health. I, again, Speaker, I will reiterate, Ontarians continue to have access to the care they need when they need it. That is our priority as a government. That is, frankly, I'm surprised that the member opposite isn't talking about the great investments that we are making in the Niagara region with the Niagara Hospital. Order. We are making the investments that, frankly, the Liberals and the NDP never did. We're making the investments because we understand in order to keep Ontario strong, we need to build Ontario, yeah, yeah. and we are doing that. We are doing that economically, in our school system, in our health care system, and we will continue to do that. Why, Speaker? Because we want Ontario to continue to be the best place to live, raise a family, and stay healthy in the province of Ontario. We'll do that. Response. The opposition can fight and talk about in issues that, frankly, we have already acted on. We are already building in Niagara a world-class health care system. Come join us. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. There being no further business, this House stands in recess until 1 p.m.